We have some people that are with us today. We're glad you guys are here. Some, I think I'm a little, little loud there, Jay. Uh, today, we're going to continue that Jesus is Greater series. Jesus is Greater. Say it out loud. Jesus is Greater. Look at somebody next to you and say, Jesus is Greater. He's Greater than your pain. He's Greater than your successes. He's Greater than the money you have in the bank. He's Greater than whatever possession you own. Jesus is Greater. He's greater than your fears. He's greater than your difficulties. He's greater than your dysfunction. He's greater than any addiction that you might have in your life. Jesus is greater. He's greater. And today we're going to talk about Jesus is greater than broken promises. For better or worse, in sickness and in health, rich or poor, till death do us part, promises made. But she left anyway. Or he traded her in on a new model, broken promises. Little Johnny said, I'm going fishing with Daddy. Daddy promised on Friday when he gets off work, I'm going fishing with Daddy. But then Friday afternoon, the phone rings and Johnny answers and Daddy says, I've got to work late, little man. I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to go fishing. Broken promises. Does any of that sound familiar? Promises we've made. We've made some promises along the way. We've broke some promises. You, you had some promises made to you that didn't happen, and that didn't feel good, did it? No. Sometimes we blatantly break our promises, have you noticed? But then other times, we, we just kind of drift away a, a little at a time. Somebody said this, that moral failure and spiritual decline are a lot like a flat tire. M most flat tires don't happen because of a blowout. They, they, be, they happen because the air leaks out over time. Sometimes you don't even know you're going flat until you're on the side of the road looking for a jack, right? You see, we, we may have trouble with our promises, but notice this. The writer of Hebrews teaches us that God is the promise keeper that never fails, Somebody do like that. And so turn in or turn on your Bible to Hebrews chapter 6. We like to turn in the Word of God. And today I want, I, want to, I want you to see that Jesus is greater than broken promises. Write it down if you have a listening guide. Jesus is greater than broken promises. Just before Jesus went to the cross, you may remember he had his last supper and, and the disciples had gathered there and he told them, one of you is going to betray me. Do you remember that every one of the disciples looked at him and said, is it me? Is, is it me? And we all know that Judas is the guy, but the disciples' question could be our question. Is it me? Am I the promise breaker? Am I going to walk away, tear up the contract, and throw in the towel and call it quits? Is it me? And the writer of Hebrews warns them in chapter 5 and chapter 6 to, six, to not forsake Jesus. Don't give up on Jesus. Don't give up on Jesus. Now, that's a good word. By the way, it's the third warning out of five that we see in the book of Hebrews. You remember, put down the milk. Pick up the meat, remember that? Move past the elementary doctrines of Christ. Grow up, he said. Mature in Christ. You should be teaching, but you're not. Uh, we, we've got to circle back to the ABCs because you've broken your promise to mature in your faith. But when you get to verse 9, he transitions to tenderness. And I don't know about you, but after all these warnings, I'm kind of ready to hear some encouraging words. So I want you to read it with me today. I'm going to read it from the New King James Version. Notice, here's what it says, beginning in verse 9. It says, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. He uses the word beloved. He's talking to believers. He's, he's talking to people who know Christ. And he said this, I, I know I've said some things that were hard to hear. I get it, but I'm confident of better things for you. You've heard the warnings, but that's because I love you. Now, if you're a parent, you get it today. You do it all the time. You, you, you tell little Billy or Sally, do not put your finger in that electrical outlet. And there's a good reason why you tell them that, right? It's not going to be a good thing. And, and you say to them, don't put the P up your nose. I mean, that's gross anyway. And, and don't do that. That's not a good thing. You do that because you love them, right? Notice in verse 10, he says, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor. By the way, underline the word work and labor 
of love, circle the word love, which you have shown toward his name and that you have, been, you have ministered to the saints and you do minister. Verse 11, he says, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence, underline that word, to the full assurance of hope, circle that word, until the end. And then he says in verse 12 that you do not become sluggish, underline that word, sluggish, or dull, and he says, but imitate those who through faith and patience, circle both of those words, faith and patience, inherit the promises. Now, Jesus is greater than broken promises, and the author of Hebrews wants us to have confidence that God is a promise keeper, and he has better things for you, things that accompany salvation. I'm confident, he said. You're going to make it, he said. You're going to go on to maturity. You're going to inherit the promises. He was confident. Now, now he didn't have that same confidence in verses 1 through 8. You remember, that's where he talked about some who he who were apostasy or, or apostates or they were living in apostasy. Verse 5, he, he says to them, they tasted the good word of God, but they didn't consume it. But, but, but they, they, they didn't bring it into their lives. They were enlightened, he said in verses 1 through 8, but they weren't transformed. In other words, they go to church, but they don't go to heaven. They, they hear it, but they don't receive it. They know about God, but they don't know God. And instead of bearing fruit, in verse 8, he tells us they bear thorns and they bear briars and they are near to being cursed. And in the end, they will be burned up. They're the ones that on the day of judgment will cry out, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? I mean, Lord, didn't, didn't we do great and mighty things in your name? I mean, really, Lord, we went to church and, and we even gave some money here and there. And Lord, we, we were people who knew you. And he's going to say these words. And the saddest words you might find recorded in the entire word of God are this. And Jesus will say, depart from me for I never knew you. You were close. You tasted the heavenly gift. You just didn't consume it. You were enlightened, but, but you really weren't transformed. But then in verse 9, he says, that's not you. Get this. You are beloved, he says. You know Jesus, the promise keeper. And so we're confident of better things concerning you. You're going to press on. You're going to make it. We're confident of better things for you, things that accompany salvation. So write this one down, and here's why. Notice what he says. You are beloved. You are saved. And by the way, confidence comes with salvation. You you have some inside information. You see, and it's okay to doubt. A lot of people doubt, and some of you perhaps today, maybe you're listening to us online, and and you're saying, you know, I just doubt whether I'm really even saved. I I don't get it. I, I don't feel it. Well, there's your problem. You're not necessarily going to feel it. Faith is not a matter of how you feel. I love Mike Hornkey, the old uh, comedian, Christian comedian, and, and he says, you know, some days you wake up like 100 pounds of cement on a popsicle stick, and you don't feel very saved, right? So it's not a matter of how you feel. It's a matter of faith. The Bible says you can be saved by grace through faith. If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, Christ was raised from the dead, you call on his name, all who call on the name of Jesus will be saved. Now, here's what happens. The very moment you come to know Christ, you get some internal information. I I mean, something on the inside begins to happen in your life. You, You have the power of the Holy Spirit that now lives in your heart. And the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to the truth that you know Jesus. When you're a child of God, God does some things in you that demonstrate that you are his. You, you know him, and then you begin to show him. And then, get this, here's the kicker. People see Jesus in you. That's how it works. And, and you can't have the things that accompany salvation without salvation. But he says this, we're confident of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation. And the author of Hebrews gives us a list of those things that accompany salvation. He starts in verse 10. By the way, write down this list because what do we say around here? Note takers are world changers. Note takers are world. So write a few of these down. Are you ready? You're going to see, first of all, in your life as a believer, fruit producing, or in other words, active love. You're going to love people you, you, you didn't care for before you came to know Christ. 
There's going to be a love that comes a part of your life because you have this internal experience of the Holy Spirit that causes you to love people that you thought you would never be able to love. And then, then there's devotion to Jesus. You're going to be devoted to Jesus. I, I mean, listen, he's going to be a priority in your life. And then number three, ministry to others. You're going to care about the needs and the hurts and the concerns and the burdens of other people. These are things that accompany your salvation. And then there's diligence to full assurance of hope. By the way, that's perseverance. You're going to hang in there even though it gets tough from time to time. You're going to walk through some valleys of the shadow of death. And like David, you're going to fear no evil. Why? Because Jesus Christ is in you. And then there's another one that he talks about, faith and patience. We're going to talk about those in a minute. Faith and and patience. Those are things that are a part of those who know Christ. So the writer of Hebrews says, I'm confident because you're saved and I see better things in you. And then he says, I'm confident not only uh, because you're saved, but I'm confident because of the character of God. Notice in verse 10 what he said, for God is not unjust to forget your work. You, you got to get this today, and I want you to come wide awake. you got to get this piece, because every one of us struggle in our faith. Is there anybody here that doesn't struggle in their faith? And, and I'm guessing there's someone listening to me, maybe in this building, maybe online, that, that you just believe you're not good enough for God to lead you into the things that accompany salvation. And it could be you've done some things in your life that have been a failure to God. And you feel, you feel that. And you know that. And you think perhaps you're disqualified from experiencing the things that accompany salvation. But I want you to come wide away because notice what it says. God is not unjust in seeing your efforts of faith. He knows and he sees. He sees your effort. He doesn't forget. You, you can be confident because of the character of God. Now, let me ask you to do this. Don't think about your, your, your failures of last week as something that has disqualified you. Because look at verse 11. He says, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of the hope until the end. So here's what the author of Hebrews wants, wants them to do. He, he, he wants them to make it. He wants them to, to get there. His confidence is connected to his desire for them. Did you notice? <laughs> and here's why. Because he's joining with them. He's in this thing together with them. And, and if you want to experience confidence, get this, then don't live in isolation. One of the things that we do, don't try to do this thing alone. You see, the devil will convince you, man, you don't need other believers. You, you don't need other people who are a part of the body of Christ to encourage you. You don't need that. I mean, you're a big boy. You got this. You can handle this. And here's the problem is you can't handle this. And, and, and you'll never be big enough to do this thing on your own. You and I need the encouragement of one another. Men, you need to get together with other men and learn and grow and be more of what Christ wants you to be. Ladies, you need to get together with other ladies and you need to grow in grace and knowledge, move on to maturity in Christ. You can't do this alone. We need people in our lives that believe we can make it and we need to be that kind of person towards others. So we need to be busy encouraging one another. And the author says this, I want you to be diligent to the full assurance of hope until the end. In other words, I want you to have an until I die kind of faith. Until I die, I'm going to walk with him. Until I die, I'm going to embrace Jesus Christ. Until I die, there's not going to be anyone else who will capture my heart. And that's going to take some diligence. And I want you to notice, I ask you to underline a couple of words in verse 10, the word work and the word labor. He didn't say it was going to be easy, did he? And what he did say is, I'm confident you can make it. You can go on to maturity. But I also know that in every season of life, there are some challenges. There are some work and there's some labor that needs to be done. So you're going to need to be diligent to make it to the end. And so God is forming us. Listen, he's shaping us. And he's going to leverage every season in our lives in order to do it. 
In James chapter 1, he says it like this. Notice what he says. He says, my brethren, my brothers, my, the beloved, those who are saved. Notice what he says. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith does what? Produces patience. And get this in verse 4. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect. And by the way, that word in the original language, that word perfect is the word telia, telia in the Greek. And what it is is the telia of an acorn is an oak. The telia of a boy is a man. The telia, its maturity is what he's talking about. You may be perfect or telia. You may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. I love the way the New Living Translation words, verse 3, read it. It says this, when your faith is tested, When it's tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. (laughs) Let me ask you a question. Does anybody know anyone who's like 45 or 50 years old, and they're like 14 or 15 emotionally? Don't look around. Don't elbow anybody in the building. It's all good. But but you know the kind of person I'm talking about? When you're with them, it's almost like you're with a teenager. You look 50, but you act 15. Now, you might know someone who grew up physically, but they didn't grow up spiritually. Now, listen, so they don't really have 30 years of following Jesus. They have one year of following Jesus repeated 30 times. Uh, There's a lot of people who don't have 40 years of marriage. They have one year of marriage repeated 40 times. That makes sense? That's because we go through trials, and if we don't embrace what God is doing in us and what God is doing through us and what matters most, then we miss it. We miss it. So you have to be diligent in every season of life. There's a great book entitled Intentional Father by John Tyson. I recommend it, but he uses some mega themes for seasons of life. He said this. He said, when a person is in their teens, they're preparing. They're prepping for life. I mean, they're preparing to go to college maybe or go to work somewhere or move out of the home maybe. And then when you get into your 20s, you're training and, and you're training. And it's an important time because maybe you're reading books and, and you're hooking up with mentors or you're asking questions. You're learning and you're growing. Then when you get into your 30s, you're building. You're building a marriage. You're building a career. And it's, by the way, this is the decade when most people buy a home, perhaps. Uh, it depends on where you are. Well, maybe the market is not in favor of you now. But, but then when you get to your 40s, that's when you start to master. You learn in your 20s and your 30s, and and then in your 40s, you begin to master a craft. You start saying no to the things that God hasn't asked you to do. You you begin to get laser focused on those things that really matter most in your life. When you're 40 is when you might even start enduring. At least you start feeling that endurance because you tend to look back. What you do, and you feel like you've come a long way. And then you start looking forward and you realize, man, I got a long ways to go. And by the way, this is the season where more midlife crises happen than any other season in most people's life. It's because when, if you're successful, you realize that it didn't really fill the void in your heart. And then sometimes you get to be 40 and you thought, well, you would be further along than you are now. And so some people go out and they get a new spouse or they get a new career. And by the way, let me suggest, just go get a new motorcycle. Keep the spouse you got. It's okay. That's just a thought. Maybe it's a Jeep, right? Chance, whatever it is. But in the 50s, then you begin to harvest. You're harvesting. You've invested. And now you're seeing some fruit from the labor. And then you get into your 60s, and and now you're guiding. Now you're starting to come along the side of other people and encourage them and give to them wisdom, and you start growing gray in your beard. I don't know. And then in your 70s, you're, you're, you're now imparting. This is where the Yodas begin to emerge. This is somebody who's walked with God for 40 or 50 years, and they've been faithful to the, to the Lord, and now their, their life becomes a part of imparting to another generation. And then in your 80s, you're savoring. I mean, you look back and you thank God for all the good things that he's done in your life. And then when people get into their 90s, they're, they're preparing for death. They're, they're getting ready to graduate. And, and in every decade, decade, God is doing something. Get this. He's doing something in you, and he's doing something through you. And God worked in every season of your life. That's why you have to be diligent to the full assurance of the hope to the very end until I die. 
Because if we're not diligent in every season, we're going to miss out on what God is doing in and through us in every season. He's shaping us and he's forming us. I love what John chapter 9 says. Jesus is speaking. Maybe you remember. Here's what he says. He says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And then Jesus is saying, there's a window for all work. I want you to get this. Maybe even write it down. There's a window for all work. I I, I mean, a window for work that God wants to do in you and a window for work that God wants to do through you. In other words, there's this internal work that God wants to do in you. And then there's this external work that God wants to do through you. So whatever season you're in, Jesus is greater because he's a promise keeper in every season. And if we'll be diligent to the full assurance of hope until the end, that's when you inherit the promises. Galatians 6, 9 says it like this. Let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. What? If we do not give up. See, there's a harvest that God wants to bring in your future that will only happen if you're faithful today. The the better things concerning you that Hebrews is talking about comes when you are faithful and diligent and you're moving toward maturity in Christ Jesus. And verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 6, it it tells it, he says that I want you to be imitators, imitators as opposed to being sluggish, or dull. Let's just read it. Verse 12, he says that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, by the way, we just got thrown back into the Old Testament, in case you don't know. In the first part of Hebrews chapter 6, it's built on the story out of Numbers chapter 6. And it's all about that generation that was not permitted to go into the promised land. You know about those guys. They blew it. They, they, they dishonored God. They became dull of hearing. And they lived in spiritual immaturity. And God said, hey, you're not going in. I'm not going to let you go in. You're going to hang out in the wilderness for 40 more years. You're going to teach and train the future generation so that they will be ready to go in. And so when you come to Hebrews chapter 6, that first part, that's what it's built on. But this part that we've read, this part of Hebrews, is built on the generation that actually inherited the promise, the ones that made it in. That, 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 that generation through faith and patience walked into the promised land. I want you to think about that for a minute. What happened in those 40 years? Let's just imagine that you're 15 years old because everybody 20 years or younger are, are in that generation. Let's pretend that you're 15. Here you are in the wilderness. You're you're starting year one of 40, and you're starting it because your parents blew it. They failed. And so 40 years now, you, you have to live in the desert, and you know you could be dining on milk and honey, but you're not because of someone else's mistake. 40 years. And if you're 15, you're not going in until you're 55, day after day. You're spending your time in the wilderness. You're eating manna, and you're thinking about how good milk and honey would taste about this time. And don't you think that these teenagers, every one of them perhaps, might have had a moment when they got bitter and angry at their parents. But guess what? That's not what happened. When when you read the story in the Bible, that's not what happened. They saw these 40 years of God's discipline as 40 years of preparation. And by faith and patience, they were ready to receive the promise from God, the promise keeper. What happened? They got discipline of being trained as warriors, trained as priests, trained as elders, trained to be fathers, and trained to be mothers. They were trained by a generation that knew firsthand how important faith and patience is. How come? Because they learned it the hard way, faith and patience. Now, here's the deal. The only way they receive the blessings of God's promises through what? Faith and patience. Faith and patience. Did, did you get that? that? That's the only way. Now, think about every season of your life. Go back to every season of your life. And God has made a provision that you can have his promise in your 20s, faith and patience. In your 30s and in your 40s and in your 50s or 60s or 70s, 80s, 90s, faith and patience so you can navigate to his promise. It was over 30 years ago, some of my buddies talked me into 
running a marathon. I did it once. I figured that was enough. But, but, but that's, uh, I learned a few things along the way. I, I learned that I had to get into a rhythm. 26.2 miles, that's a long ways to run. And I knew also that I had to somehow cull my competitive juices because it's not a race. You know, I tried to outrun it. I mean, listen, I'm just trying to survive, right? It's a long way. And, and if I had tried to sprint it, I would have never made it. Wouldn't happen. I just had to survive. And so one of my buddies told me this. He said, you know, Paul, what you need to do is you just need to settle in. <laughs> now, we'd run a lot of 5Ks and 10Ks and building up to a marathon. You know, you, you, try to, you, you try to run more and more and more. And so we'd run some 15 and 18 milers prior to. And, and, and that, those were hard. Uh, and I couldn't imagine. But on the day when it came to run, he just said, you've got to settle in. And you have to breathe. And you have to put one foot in front of the other. You, you just think you're going to finish. You, you're, going to, you, you're going to complete this, but, but you just put one foot in front of the other. You, you, you just keep going, and you just keep going. One foot. You have to settle that this is what you're going to do. You put one foot in front of the other. Now listen carefully. Some of you are exhausted because you're looking at your life like a sprint. And let me make an earth-shattering statement to you today. The Christian life is not a sprint. No, no. The Christian life is a marathon. That's why so many of you are exhausted. So many people get exhausted is that they're trying to spread out their Christian life. You know, you, you, you'll see it for a week or two or maybe a month, maybe even six months. Man, they're on fire. Let's go. Let's get it done. Uh, we, we're going to chase down the gates of hell with a water pistol. I mean, we got this. And then all of a sudden, they're gone. What, what, some season of life, some difficulty uh, now has overcome them. They're sprinting. Maybe they'll get back in the blocks and maybe they'll, they'll run another sprint at some other point in their life. I get it, but that's not what the Christian life is. The Christian life is a marathon. It's settling in, breathing and putting one step in front of the other. It's a marathon, committing to the long haul. And here's what we have to do. We have to fight the tendency to be lazy because the reward comes at the end of the race. And God is saying, there's a way that you can run and make it all the way to the finish line. And you can stand before God and you can hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, listen to the author of Hebrews. You can make it. You hear him. You can make it. I know you can. I, I'm confident of better things for you. There, there's a harvest ahead. There's a promise. And Jesus is greater than your broken promises. Jesus is going to bring you to the finish line. Faith and patience. There's a crown of righteousness for those who endure. Don't get lazy. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Others have made it. Listen to what he says. And you too can imitate them through faith and patience. That's how you inherit the promises of God. Now, I want you to go back to that 15-year-old. He, he's 15, but he's having his 55th birthday. And the day has finally come when he gets to put his foot into the promised land. He made it. Wow. Can you hear him? I, I made it. I'm 55. I've been out in this wilderness for 40 years. I've been eating this manna, and God has provided, and I'm so grateful that God has provided. But now, now I'm here to realize the promise of God. The same way you're going to realize the promise of God. Faith and patience. I don't know if you can hear God say to you this morning, I'm waiting for you to say, I, I need help. I, I, I need you to step in. I, I don't know if you can hear God say to you, I, I, you need my power to persevere. Ephesians chapter 6 says that the God of unlimited resources can strengthen you to give you the power, the power that you need to persevere. Even if, you're, even if you've broken your promise, Jesus is greater than your broken promises. Jesus is the promise keeper, and he can give you exactly what you need to keep putting one foot in front of the other. 
And here's the reason. So you can be the kind of person that, that gets to the end of the race and you hear these words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, with faith and with patience. Now, how many of you know this? How many of you know that you can't take the next step without taking the first step? You, you, you can't take the next step without taking the first step. You say, well, preacher, that's pretty simplistic. Yeah, it, it's pretty simplistic. So, so what is the first step? Well, you'll notice in verses 1 through 8, he addressed a group of people who really hadn't taken the first. Some of them thought they had, but they hadn't. And, th and then in verses 9 through 12, he, he addresses those who had taken the first step, but yet somewhere along the way, they had a tendency to get sluggish. I mean, get a little lazy. And so here's my questions for two people today. Two types of people, two kinds of people, two groups of people. To, to the first group, it's those who have never taken that first step. See, you see, verses 9 through 12, you're going to have a hard time dealing with that you, because you, you have to take the first step before you can get into this group that he's talking about that he's saying, hey, you're going to make it, you're going to make it, you're going to make it. Let, let me promise you, if you haven't taken the first step, you will never make it. If you haven't taken the first step, then the promises of God are not yours. Because the promises of God are for those who know him. And so, so here it is. Here, here's the first step. Are you ready? If you've not taken the first step, if you're with us in this building or you're with us online and you've never taken the first step, what is it? It's to know him as your Lord and as your Savior. It's to call on his name and receive him into your heart.